Hello, welcome to the Chess Boxing Podcast. This week we've got uh, founder of London Chess Boxing on the podcast, Tim Woolgar. Hello, Kevin. Uh, great to be here. So Tim's joining us all the way from Australia. We've also got uh, Matt Crazy Arms Reed. Hello, everybody. Great, Tim. Uh, how have you been, mate? I've been very well, thanks. Yes, um, doing a bit of world travelling and um, d- discovering uh, new places, new people, and uh, all new experiences. But um, it all came back to chess boxing at the weekend, didn't it? That was a pretty awesome fight, or se- several pretty awesome fights. Yeah, I have to say, although I'm kind of patting myself on the back here a little bit, but I felt that all the fights were very well matched. I was really pleased because it doesn't always work yes, out. Yes, they were very well matched, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I would, I would say too well matched. I was looking for more of a mismatch. I feel like uh, I was promised a much weaker boxing opponent and a much weaker chess opponent, and then Dan Hall turned up, so I, I feel slightly screwed. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was a fantastic night. I mean, absolutely excellent fights, real yeah. back and forth, <clears throat> real yeah, narrative. Your, your flat track bullying didn't quite work out, did it? No. <clears throat> no. Yeah, so big shout out to Dan. In all fairness, though, Matt, I... I, without a shadow of a doubt, your I thought your bout was the most gripping and entertaining bout and the best quality fight as well. So I really thought you were going to um, uh, win through the boxing at one point and you know stop put a stoppage in in the last round. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> your, your boxing has got so much so much way better in the last twelve months. So that that's that's really great. Sadly, your chest has got. That much worse so you know you're still in the, the same position you were I, I actually thought i was getting back into the fight right up into the point where the arbiter stops the cross and basically sort of says that's checkmate the game's over and I, i've never actually no, over- come on you you knew I, you saw the mate coming about five seconds before it happened i saw it on your face five seconds before it happened but 10 seconds after i played it i think is is the critical uh, point yeah. I, I don't normally make a move yeah and, that's right and then be confronted with oh no that's an app absolute jaffa i mean I, it wasn't the first yeah. move start of a round but it, it was still quite early in the chess round and i felt dreadful of that because i deprived myself of at least one more round of boxing well that, actually i think you were coming back mate into- on the board it was painful oh it is there's nothing worse and as i said as i said to uh, Zena, it was um it was a reverse back ranker which is Back ranker from behind, one of the most painful ways to be checkmated in, in the whole game of chess, isn't it? I was about to say, anything from behind when she don't see coming really does hurt uh, more ways. <laughs> so very good, Matt, very good. Um, but I thought, I thought um, the chess game was great because obviously Dan's a stronger player and he took an early sort of advantage. And uh, But you showed so much grit. Like you were not having it. You you really came back into the chess, and it was. I was a bit of a shame that it was like I played such bad chess in the first sort of ten twelve moves that there there almost seemed like there was a stink coming off the board. Like <laughs> I was sitting at the board and I was like, "What is that smell? Is it, is it me? Did I not shower before getting into the ring?" And I suddenly realised, no, it's just this mess of a position that I got myself into. And then I was like. Yeah, well, the boxing first boxing round didn't go well either. So I kind of lost the first chess round and the first boxing round. So it was kind of like a pride thing because, you know, I'm the most prolific chess boxer, quantity over quality. But Dan's come in having not yes. really boxed before, worked his ass off for four months. And it was the first time he'd ever set foot in a chess boxing ring. And I was like, you know, we've got a, we've got a beginner here and he is showing me up. So you do get a bit of pride and that pride. Yeah, really- he, yeah, he didn't look like a beginner at all, did he? He, he, he fought like he, he was born to it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, he, uh, he was under pressure, though. I mean, like I said, if you had not have missed that one move, mate, at the end, then um, I felt like he was going down because you had used your experience to bash back into it. So I would say he got lucky. But nevertheless, he earned his luck. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree with that. So do you want to just take us through the chess game a little bit, Matt? Yeah, so um, I was playing with the white pieces and I started with my usual shonky 1b4, which is not a standard opening move for those that aren't particularly familiar with chess. Normally you move your pawn in front of your king or your queen. Uh, I, Polish opening, is it? Yeah, it's like it's known as either the Polish opening or the orangutan mm-hmm. because apparently moving that pawn two squares forward looks like an orangutan's arm going up a cage that was the original sort of um 
uh, history of how. Not that... an easy opening to face if you haven't faced it before, you know, uh, or even if you have. The easy. idea behind it, Matt, is because people have not don't get used. Mo most people are used to playing e4 or d4 openings. And so they've got a repertoire for that. But when B4 comes out, you're like, oh, what do I do? You know, the whole thing is unfamiliar for the first like 10, 20 weeks. I hate playing against you when you do that. Yeah, I mean, it's all about comfort zones. You're right. And like, I, I don't feel particularly comfortable in a boxing ring. So realistically, if I can take somebody out of their comfort zone on the chessboard, it kind of evens it up. So, so do, you, do you think you actually were able to do that to Dan? To no, him? no, I don't think I unsettled him at all. He because, probably expected it. I mean, he's played you at, at the club a few times. Yeah, we, I mean, we, we often, because of the nature of the training sessions, you tend to play against everybody eventually. So we had had a few games, but it's not exactly the world's biggest secret that I'm a 1v4 player in chess boxing. So it's quite easy from the chess boxing database, which is chessboxing.info if you've never checked it out. Um, you can see many of my previous games and then... If you can see many of my previous games, you can start to prepare a strategy on how to counter it. And I think Dan, he did his homework. I mean, you can't you can't blame a man that does his prep, does his research and comes fully sort of armed. Yeah. So, yeah, chess went badly. Uh, first 10 moves. I had a slight disadvantage. Um, went into the boxing. Um, yeah. And kind of got out jabbed, which as a sort of a, quite a tall man doesn't normally happen to me. Uh, but Dan's pretty tall himself. He's got to be a good sort of 6'4", maybe 6'5", and he's got nice and long arms as well. And he had a very effective jab as well, which meant that my reach wasn't anything special. And I kind of got picked apart. I got jabbed and I got a few big hits taken. So when I came back for... Oh, the come on, mate. You're making it sound like, you make it sound like depressing. It wasn't that bad. You, you landed a few back, you know, it was all, it was all fun and games. It's all fun and games until somebody gets hit. Um, and I did get hit. Yeah, quite yeah. Round. But in the second round, I tightened up the guard, listened to my corner coach, which was a, a chap from London Chess Boxing's uh, Islington Boxing Gym that we use on Saturday mornings, a chap called Stan. He's very sort of sergeant major, drill, drill sergeant, gave me some very succinct, slightly colourful advice about what was going wrong and how to improve it. And I tried to put that into action. And like you say, just because I was a little bit down, uh, on the chess, I started to play a little bit quicker to try and get the time a lot more on my side and put him under pressure. So I tried to make moves that gave him a question that he had to answer. I didn't make anything easy. It was always like, if you do nothing, I'll take this. So you have to defend that. So I was, I went on the initiative uh, and I think that helped. Once he was on the back foot, I gained a nice bit of time, got a couple of pawns back that I'd sort of jettisoned in the first round of the chess. Yeah, and yeah, that's right. It you look, you look positive at that point, yeah. Yeah, and then I uh, right Things at the end. Were looking uh, good. We we had a we had an exchange of uh, minor pieces, which really helped me because he traded a bishop for a knight, and I tried to trade one of my bishops for one of his knights. And what it meant was that we both traded the opposite coloured bishops. So what we were left with is I had a light squared bishop, and no, he had a light squared bishop, and I had a dark squared bishop, which definitely increases the drawing opportunities, which is what I wanted. I wanted to have a uh, more of a drawn chess game so I could drag out the boxing and try and get a points win. Uh, it's not exactly the most uh, thrilling for the crowd, but no, at, the same time, at the same time, you've uh, got to do whatever you can because no, to, so to knock somebody out takes an awful lot of power, energy, fitness, and I didn't have that, so it was going to have to be a... I, th I think a draw in the chess really sets up that last boxing round. I think it's great. I yeah, mean, it, it would have been yeah. close as well. So mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of shame that I've deprived the chess boxing audience, those that were watching the stream at home or those that watch now on YouTube, um, of a decent thing and the audience there they seem to love it they seem to like it it was a big of a contrast to the first fight that they just watched because uh, they'd seen some real back and forth haymaker type boxing yeah um, so this was a little bit more I wouldn't say um, no, it was good it was a good it was a good match to watch because it was exciting it, it went up and down both ways first it looked like you were going to lose then you clawed it back and then it felt like you were certainly going to win and then uh, it went the other way so that's what you want uh, drama, drama. Exactly. But the, the real question now is, since, as you rightly point out, your 1v4 opening is pretty common knowledge, what about um, thinking about a new unorthodox opening, like maybe G4 or something for a change? G4, I, I love the idea. G4 that, would put the cat amongst the people. I love the idea that I've got to switch from my B4 because everybody knows about it. So I switch to G4 and announce it on a podcast so that everybody knows about it. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, uh, I think I'm not going to... Well, listen, it could be a double bluff. 
Yeah, exactly. I certainly will not be playing G4 in my next chess boxing fight, which I guess is the seven. I've, I've, got, I've got six, seven months to basically come up with a new strategy before I fight again, unless some of these European partners of ours decide to host some more chess boxing. Well, actually, as you as you mentioned that, we're, where are we at the moment, Matt? Uh, we're in a, a lovely, small, very quaint Italian town of Vigivano, which is about 40 kilometres uh, outside of Milan. So we flew into Milan yesterday. Yeah. We made our way in a very nice taxi down to here. We've got ourselves a lovely Airbnb about 400 meters. That's square. very nice. Reads very expensive. Yeah, slight tourist trap. Um, so then we've uh, we've got a lovely piazza uh, about 400 meters away, where there's going to be some outdoor chess boxing, possibly with its own light show tomorrow, because we've been promised thunder and lightning. So uh, hopefully we get a bit of disco yeah. effect. So we're we're here to watch. Uh, you got a taxi from from Milan up there, did you? Yeah, from the airport. Yeah. Well, good, good luck on getting back. Last time I went to a chess boxing show on the outskirts of Milan, I did the same thing. Uh, and we, we got a taxi to the destination, no problem. But getting a taxi to come there and take you back into Milan, whoa, yeah. there was no taxi. It was, it's like, you know, you're really back into the, in, 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 a, in a, I don't know, the, in, in dawn of history time. It's horses and carts out in that countryside there. There's no, ta- there's no Ubers, there's no taxis. There's no buses, there's no trains. I know. You, you Good know, luck, guys. It's a situation when you have no Uber. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A tax- civilization, man. Taxis aside, we are looking forward to seeing Richard, uh, the Razor Fraser, fight tomorrow. Shout out to him. Yep. Oh, yeah, um, that'll be good, yeah. That's going to be great. Um, and also, shout out to Volfango and his team putting on the event. Um, and we're also going to be... Is Richard fighting Daniel Dada? Well, I was going to get into that. No, he's not. <laughs> Um, but Daniel is actually fighting uh, somebody else. So, he, so Daniel, who fought on our show last Saturday, is now fighting uh, tomorrow, um, only six days afterwards. So that's got to be the quickest turnaround in chess boxing history. I mean, aside from the World Championships, where you do fight a little bit more regularly. Well, in fairness, I think Tim ran an event where it was. Oh shit! I fought two nights in row. Actually, yeah, no, the two, um, two two fights in the same night. You did, didn't you? No, I did. I did two fights in two nights because we ran the Oracle one at St Paul's, and I took on Isidro Getty, and then we came over and did the Yellow Brick fundraiser. That was on the same night. No, it was a different night. One was Friday, okay. one was Saturday. No, but you did, did, Tim. Didn't you run an event where you had did four we? and no the way. fought each other in the same night? Uh. I don't think we ever did that in the end. We we want it was in the we we planned to do it, but we couldn't get enough. Like four, uh, what do we need? What do we needed? Like um, yeah, we did, we couldn't get all the same fighters in the same weight group and the same. Okay. Just couldn't do the matching. Okay. So we it was a, it was a concept, but uh, it never came together. Well, one for the future. But um, yeah, there's no reason why you shouldn't do two fights in one night. I mean, it's only. You know, if they're short fights, I'm not talking about doing, you know, an 11 rounder. Um, but just just touching on uh, on Daniel Rotter there, um, what did you think his of his fight? Because he had a similar situation, a little bit of a Jaffa situation going on there after a round of boxing. And um, I think we're all very pleased at London Chess Box to see one of our own, um, Cheyenne Dulab, win his first ever chess boxing fight on the fifth time of asking i was about to say to see a see, see a one in the w yeah. column is very gratifying i'm now just waiting for lars to get his w and then everybody that's big basically never achieved that would be great uh, what about me well, re- why don't you recap <laughs> recap recap what happened at the end of that fight for the for the, for uh, for us and so that uh, there we got a picture of it well i to be honest i didn't follow the chest too closely because i i was quite busy but um, I know Daniel to be a very a, a decent chess player, but very trappy. He's won two of his fights on uh, the first round of chess. Uh, I think with Queen Traps. In fact, I think one of them was actually against Richard Fraser, which he doesn't like me to remind everyone about. But um, it was really yeah. the first round of boxing where Cheyenne very much took the boxing to him. And uh, yeah, I think you could, if, I'm, I'm sure... Daniel won't mind me saying that it, 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 he appeared to be visibly shaken uh, at that at the end of that boxing round. I think Sean had a lot more than perhaps he was yeah. expecting. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Um, and Sean was definitely. Yeah. He was just moving better, and he just had slightly better technique. 
and he was able to land and retreat and Daniel didn't really have much in terms of attacking boxing but he's known mm -hmm. he's he's got a tough chin you know he can he can he can manage his way through a boxing round pretty well and he did manage to do that um but I think when they sat down to play chess so it's obviously uh, that had affected his, his chess ability. What do you know actually what happened, Max? I'm, I don't know. From memory, it was uh, um, with um, Daniel playing with the white pieces. Uh, he he took a pawn, which looked like it was just a free pawn, unprotected, I think, on a6. Um, but what Shine had set up, which was rather clever, and I presume that Shine had already got this in his mind from the end of the previous chess round, was that he'd basically got his queen and his bishop uh, on the same uh, on the same rank as um, as uh, Daniel's queen, and then he was able to play a bishop check on h2, which basically revealed that the queen can now capture uh, Daniel's queen. And I mean, that's the biggest bit of artillery you've got on a chessboard is your queen. And once you've lost your queen, it's basically like having an arm chopped off in the boxing. You really can't fight one armed, uh, and you really can't play your chess to any real level. Once you've lost your queen, you just don't have any sort of material left to sort of magic up a, a, a sort of a fight back. So did he quit? Yeah, so he, he is, resigned. Yeah. We, we call it chess submission uh, as opposed to quitting or resigning. Yeah. But yeah, chess submission. It sounds like somebody could have gave up. Yeah, he gave up. Oh, that's that's that uh, that um, that's not great, is it? I believe that uh, you should fight on to the bitter end. Uh, you never know what may happen. I mean, Cheyenne is a decent player, but. Anything is possible, but anything is possible when you're chess boxing. You know that he might have given his own queen away in the next round. So, I was yeah, say, I would have carried on fighting if I was him. An opportunity to win it on boxing. I've, I firmly have the opinion that you should never be able to resign a chess game, and it should be ended by checkmate, especially for the weaker players in the audience to see, you know, the actual mm -hmm. conclusion as opposed to we've seen enough of that. We all know how it ends when probably half the audience don't know how it will end. So, but yeah. you know. When you are getting um, your, um, you know, uh, when you when you let's let's say when the boxing is one sided, when you're getting pummeled, then oh, I... uh, a swift resignation might seem like the uh, lesser of two evils, might not it? Yeah, from a competitor's point of view, I want to be able to resign. From a spectator's point of view, I don't even think it should be in the rules. So it's it's an interesting debate. Sometimes you just want to get the hell out of there when some, some when something's going so badly and you don't feel there's any chance of coming back. Well, perhaps we should make a submission. You can always throw in the towel. Yeah. Yeah. Well, perhaps we should make a submission to the WCBA and suggest a potential rule change. That no, you cannot resign. Well, okay. What about this then? We. Um... Instead of instead of resigning on the board, you actually have to ask your corner to throw in the towel to make it a little bit more uh, yeah. of, a, of a gesture. It's either that or you just use uh, your left arm, you sweep all the pieces off the board, and you go, why must I lose to this fucking idiot? And I think that would also count as a great decision. <laughs> <laughs> then we're in the same situation as you and Chris Levy, where no one actually has any idea what's just happened. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, just speaking of Chris, actually. Oh, um, yeah, that was confusing, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, just speaking of Chris, we're very lucky to have both Chris and um, Simon Williams com co uh, commentating on the show. What the did Ginger you think GM, I think this is fantastic. I mean, Tim, you, you watched. Ginger GM and Chris worked well together. It was a great partnership. Uh, they, their commentary was really good. And obviously, you know, we've had Simon commentate before. We've been we've been lucky in that regard. But um, yeah, he, his, his commentary skills just growing with every passing year. In fact, I think we had him so early in chess boxing's history, he wasn't even the ginger GM then. I mean, obviously he was ginger and he was a yeah, GM. Yeah, prior to his ginger GM days, yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. And, and so is, Had YouTube even been invented then? I don't know. Is this in addition to his arbiting? He actually did the commentary as well, did he? I yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did the commentary at an early event in Tufnell Park, funnily enough, exactly the same venue. Okay. Same he, venue, yeah, same venue. That's the Lawrence Trent from memory. So it was the, it was the yeah, Williams right. Trent event. Well, a shout out to uh, to both Chris and Simon and uh, Lawrence. We'd love to see him back at chess boxing, I'm sure. I know he's been training in uh, Berlin at the chess boxing club there. Um, so I wonder yes. if he's looking for a, yeah, a bout against, against somebody, maybe even Simon. I mean, that would be fantastic, wouldn't it? But Slight weight disparity between the two at the moment, but I think actually once I si gets training, I, I would say that that's actually a really good fight. And certainly they're incredibly closely matched at the Blitz. They've probably played hundreds of Blitz games against each other, know each other inside and out. 
both very competitive people. Uh, sai has got a bit of a martial arts background, so it'd be impossible to say who's got the uh, the edge in that. I'd definitely like to see it. Um, and we should probably, we're sort of running out a little bit out of time. So perhaps let's talk about the other two bouts uh, on the night. What, what do you think of the uh, the intros, Tim, for the first bout of the of the night? So we had uh, Russell Alam. Oh, the Bond but, intro, uh, yeah, the, the, the 007 thing. That was awesome. I, I thought that was super cool, yeah. I, I think uh, the James Bond one, uh, it was just the amount of the pause that he had and the way he held himself. And he didn't run. It was just incredible. Like, I just wanted it last for it to last forever. <laughs> Don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> I, I was actually. Walking and they up. both. They both didn't. They both have suits on or something. They were both had jackets on. I mean, they, it was like they were sitting down to um, cafe yeah. chess from the 1930s or something. Yeah. Well, I didn't realise until the night when I saw them that actually Andrew was wearing all black and he had the white pieces, and, <laughs> and Russell was wearing all white and he had the black pieces. Um, I don't think it really made a difference. It was, no, yeah. no, it's top notch. We should make that a make that a general um, a rule that everyone has to come dressed in a white or black suit from future from future. I think. I think you should color code. I love it. We've already color coded the corners. We color coded the gloves. We color coded the trunks. So it's so yeah. much easier for the audience at home to think. Oh yeah, white pieces, white gloves, white shorts. He's playing with the white pieces. It's easy. Uh, so yeah, if we even did the intros. Mm. Come in with a white t-shirt on or come in with your white suit. And Tim, what did you think of Andrew's hair as well? Pretty awesome, right? It was pretty awesome, yeah. <laughs> the pink hair, you mean? Yes, that's the one. That's the pink hair. Hair. I, I don't know. It was, I mean, I, I couldn't tell whether that was something that, because obviously I'm not as close to him as you guys are, so I'm just assuming that's the way he cuts about every day anyway, or was that done for the show? He generally has pretty crazy hair, actually, but not as crazy as that. It was done yeah. for the show. He, he had like a platinum blonde, and he'd done very much like a silvery look mm -hmm. a while ago. But pink was was, was uh, new. Um, and and actually, I thought he showed. Yeah, no, it, it looked fantastic. It looked fantastic, and uh, yeah, really added a little bit of uh, colour to proceedings. Yeah. And Russell, as the weaker chess player, you could see that he was really going after Andrew, and it took a few yeah thirty seconds yeah. of the boxing. <laughs> Before Andrew was like, well, I'm not having this. And then it was just open season, wasn't it? They were just both throwing haymakers left and right. It was absolutely great entertainment. You could, you could tell that they weren't experienced because, as you say, the opening, they, they seemed afraid to throw punches, almost like they didn't want to hurt each other. Uh, and then, as you say, when, when, when they realised, yeah, this is what we're here for, they really settled into it nicely. And there was some, some, some good uh, back and forth. I liked it. Yeah, but it was it was fantastic, and um, and what did you what did you think of the uh, the third bout we had Tim on the night? Oh, I know. To be honest, can I speak on this one just because I know both of these fighters uh, very well, having met them and known them in the chess world before they even came to chess boxing. So this is James Corrigan, uh, who goes under the ring name of Spice Boy. Um, no idea why. <laughs> and uh, and Andrew Smith, uh, who's um, who's a chess tutor, and I just thought it was absolutely awesome that they sort of managed to come from literally no boxing background whatsoever, be friends, but actually put aside that friendship to basically compete, train separately uh, and really leave it all in the ring. Um, I, I thought it was, um, I probably shouldn't mention this, but James had a slight accident on his way to the ring. He was getting a little bit sort of caught up in the energy of the crowd. And I think he missed a step on the way up into the ring and absolutely stumbled, stacked it right back into the ropes and down. I've never seen anyone enjoy their ring walk as much as James though. <laughs> like you could just tell. Yeah, yeah, that was good. He was on cloud <laughs> nine and it was really, there's nothing better than seeing someone who's really, really enjoying themselves. He's here exactly. I the thought same both boxer. those guys were experienced boxers, you know, I thought they'd been in the ring a few times and uh, I had no idea they were friends. So there so you go. Started, started training properly at Christmas. Um, and yeah, they've known each other for a number of years already. So that was quite awesome. And I just thought, you know, James is such a happy, smiley person. He's the only person I know that smiles during sparring. You know, mm -hmm. even if he gets hit in the face. Well, Felix does as well. Actually, no, Felix does as well. Yeah. And then Felix dishes it back out. But James is quite happy to get a punch in the face and then put the smile back on his face, get punched again, and the smile's still there. You can't punch it away. I've tried. And I thought, I thought Andrew's ring walk was good as well. Like he had quite a lot of presence. Um, sort of, he went for a bit more of a darker sort of heel type uh, entrance, 
And I know that um, he, he'd been working on that, as a lot of the fighters did with Kate Gilbert, our performance oh, coach. Yeah, awesome. um, who's, who's oh, fan- yeah, she's very good, Kate Gilbert, yeah. And I think in terms of like what, what she brought to the show, yeah. it was it was really palpable, wasn't it? I think you could really tell those that had actually taken the time to, to, to uh, take that performance workshop and uh, really put the effort in, and it, I think it definitely paid off. Yeah, hundred um, percent. So yeah, what, how how was it watching um, watching the stream, Tim? Was there quite a lot of buzz online uh, about uh, proceedings? Yeah, definitely. Um, the Twitch stream was buzzing with the chat rooms, and uh, there was quite a lot of uh, response and stuff going up on on Instagram and. Uh, and so on. Yeah, Twitter not so much, but uh, the other the other outlets here yeah, were pretty busy. Yeah. Um, and I think we had roughly two thousand people watching the online stream, which is great. I mean, we're we're now reaching more people than online everyone. than we than we are in, in the room. So, um, if you wanna if you wanna catch the show, of course, you can still see um, it on our YouTube channel and our Twitch channel. It'll be up there for a few weeks. Um, so yeah, go and check that out. And um, Matt, you mentioned we've got another show coming up after the summer in December. Oh, yes. Season's Beatings on the 10th of December. Is that, Are we certain it's Season's Beatings? Or are you going with a possible... Well, we perhaps with something we can just briefly discuss, Tim. Um, somebody suggested to me that we might want to do a Day of the Dead event. Uh, you know, sort of uh, Mexican-style uh, Day of the Dead with uh, sort of skeleton themes kind of thing. Yeah, reggaeton, like high energy music, uh, that kind of At stuff. Christmas. Well, Day of the Dead is actually the end of November, um, so we would be a few days after the actual date. Um, but I, I thought think it was the end of October. I always thought Day of the Dead was Halloween, but uh, okay, fine. Yeah, no, I'm, I, that would be great. I mean, why not do something different? Yeah, call it Day of the Dead if you want. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Dawn of the Dead. <laughs> um, um, so we'll see. I, I, at the moment, we, it's listed as Caesar's Beatings uh, 22, but I don't know. I feel porn, like Porn of the Dead. Porn of the Dead. Porn of the... Dawn of the Dead. Uh, Dawn of the... Porn of the Dead. <laughs> yeah, possibly. No, it's done. Oh, okay. yeah, it's it's done right, does it? But down. you know what? It's close. It's a bit like necrophilia. Uh, like, <laughs> yeah, we why don't I just get, call it necrophilia? We, we, might, we might just get a few extra people on our stream that get rather disappointed <laughs> when I turn up. Yeah. Um, we'll just go with necrophilia. That's fine. <laughs> Tagline, Porn of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's bad publicity, guys. Um, Great show for all the family at Christmas. Yeah, there you go. So you heard it here first. So, Tim, have you got anything else to add before we uh, sign off the podcast? Not a thing. No, that's it. Um, well, I'd say it's really good to see you, mate. I'm not, I'm not getting paid by the word, am I? No, I didn't think You're so. not getting paid at all, actually, Tim. As it turns out, we're a little bit short of funds at the moment. <laughs> and, Matt, have you got anything else to oh, add? Great. No, other than the fact that I uh, just thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and I uh, hope to see you at the next show. That's great. Yeah, so you can see uh, the next show at the Dome Topper Park in London. Tickets at uh, chessboxingnation.com. 10th of December. Go and get your tickets now. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you can't make it so you can watch the live stream. And all that's left is for me to say thank you very much. Chessboxingnation.com. <laughs> can, can we get a hippo sound from you, Tim, please? I'll second that. Oh, we want a hippo, uh, hippo sound. sound. Oh, yeah, I have to practice it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've lost Tim going to baboon. <laughs> uh, and can we get? Yeah, a- be surprised at how accurate that is. I, it's taken me a long time to perfect that. It's definitely not a baboon. No, I thought it was pretty good actually. Do you want to? Do you want to sign off for the uh, hippo sound? So, as you know, how it sounds apparently, Matt. Uh, no, yeah, no. See, yeah, well, you do hippo. No, sound. I can only do baboons. Go on, then, do baboon, no, then. no, 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 no. Go on, no. then. Let's hear your baboon. That's no, pretty good, actually. That was a laugh, actually. So, uh, yeah, not bad. Yeah, yeah. And actually, to, something else to mention is that if you guys can't make the next show but want to come along to training, I run the training for chess boxing every Saturday morning. We mention it all the time, but it's Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. to 11:30 at Islington Boxing Club. You can either find it on our website or you can just Google Islington Boxing Club. 
Great. Thanks very much, guys. Very nice to catch up. And uh, yeah, we'll be with another podcast in a couple of weeks. <laughs>